Okay, so now I wanna to talk to you about some core principles about how light works and ways that we can think about it when we're trying to generate lighting for our scene. We know how to use a camera and how to use lights, but we wanna be more purposeful about it. So the first thing to understand that's really important is that how color and light works together. This is not a red stapler. Red does not exist inside the stapler. Red exists in the light. In fact, everything but the color red exists as it is absorbed into the stapler. If we took a, a scene like this and we just removed red light from it, it becomes a black stapler. If you were in a room and you shone a light that was this pure aqua blue on it, it wouldn't reflect red at all because there's no red light to reflect. This is important for us to think about. Like I talked about the other day, thinking about physically based rendering, light is really important here. And that's how we're understanding where that light comes from is really crucial. And again, a review of our color. Remember, we're thinking about color in terms of hue, saturation, and value. Hue being the sort of color the thing is, saturation being how much of that color is in it, going from a pure saturated version of the color, like very vibrant and bright, to gray, completely gray, uh, without any color in it at all. And then lastly, value, this model of closeness from black to white, going from a black to a pure white. So on the outside of, of this sort of value, we get a pure black, and on the inside of saturation and value, we get pure white. And this is how we're modeling our color. Light has a lot of properties to it in terms of thinking about it. For one is value. Uh, if you've ever taken a painting class, one of the first things that they'll have you do is try to create a gradation from white to black. It introduces you to mixing color, but it also helps you to think in terms of grayscale. I remember this when I was studying painting, and at first they said, okay, do eight, and then it was 12, and then it was 20, and then it was like, let's, can you do 100? Can you get 100 perfectly evenly spaced out gradations from white to black. And so value is maybe the first thing we understand about light. The next thing we want to think about is what we call the noton. This is what is in light and what is not. It's almost as if we threw it into something like Photoshop and really bumped up the contrast. What are the areas of light and what are the areas of dark? Um, we think about this when painting is often, artists will, will paint like this at first, they'll do big blocks of color or blocks of light in dark areas to help us figure these things out because the light actually gives us the idea of silhouette. The woman is visible in this painting because she's set against a dark background. If the background was as bright as her dress, if this mantelpiece was the same color, we wouldn't be able to see her. She wouldn't stand out to us. And remember, everything we're doing is largely 2D images we're seeing on a two-dimensional screen. So we need to use light to help these things stand out. And then the third property that's really important is chiaroscuro. Uh, this is sort of a painting technique that became very popular, but we can think about it from our lighting standpoint of where are the edges? Where are the edges of the shadow? Whereas our value gives us this sense of how bright or dark something is, our noton helps us create silhouettes to knock objects out from it. Our chiaroscuro tells us what something is shaped like. We're carving, we're painting with light. This woman's face wouldn't be as clear to us if it didn't involve this very strong light. In fact, it was the Dutch painters that were really popularizing this technique. If you look at earlier Renaissance work, they didn't use a lot of chiaroscuro, which meant that figures and characters looked very flat on the scene because even though they might be painted with very realistic proportions and colors, they didn't have this strong sense of edge shadow to help define all the features. You think about that when you draw a sphere and you shade it in with your pencil that, oh, that's just how you draw a sphere. But that's actually a traditional technique that someone had to figure out in the Renaissance. And it's not been figured out as long as you think. It's only about 400 years that we've known how to do that. Color wheels are a great way of understanding light and breaking it down, but they're actually just models. In fact, if you've ever seen um, early computer graphics models, uh, computer programmers just broke down colors evenly and the artists complained, we can't use these. These colors don't make any sense. And the programmer said, it's perfect. It, it's exactly even divisions between all the colors. But of course, we don't perceive color that way. We tend to group colors as more important. In some cultures, they don't even see a distinction between blue and green. They see them as the same light colors because they don't have a language for it. That's one of the things I'm talking about when I say language is so more important. The more words you have for different colors, the more types and gradations and values and hues of colors you can actually see. So there's tons of models, but you're probably most, you're most uh, uh, familiar with this complementary model in which uh, the colors are arranged opposite each other. Uh, this is sort of a paint-based model, and even though we're using 
uh, R, like the, the sort of RGB instead of the RYB model like we're seeing here, this is still pretty much the system that we're understanding it. It's that idea of that there is cool versus warm values and that anything we get closer we get to the middle of some of these rings, the higher in their chroma or color value they are. So as I mentioned before, color harmonies are really important to put into our scenes, into our compositions. And since we're working with light and textures, we can start to think about how we're putting those color harmonies together. How will um, a red object work with a green light? Well, the reason these complementary things work is because they'll actually, they don't possess each other's colors. It helps us get contrast. Think back about the Noton, you know, black versus white, that contrast gives a silhouette. Well, something like red versus green can also give us contrast, can also give us a silhouette. And contrast creates areas of interest. It creates things that are interesting to look at. This is part of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, of course, I mentioned a lot of these before, these different models of color, like analogous, picking a single color and going to the sides, triadic being a triple balance. But the probably most common is this complementary color scheme, picking a color opposite of the other color. And I would say second most common that I like to use a lot is the split complementary, where we just take basically the complementary value and we just evenly push it out in either direction. Color also has a lot to do with mood and color is very cultural. Different cultures have different beliefs about styles of color. This is an example of a breakdown of how in the Western world we tend to think about colors. But in some place, um, white is the color of evil or Purple might be a color representing death, or red might be a color that represents something like a wedding because it's associated with wedding dresses culturally in that region. But what we want to think about is just contextualize what your color means. So green usually means nature. Blue is a psychologically very cooling color. Red and orange are very exciting and vibrant colors. Uh, pink is a vibrant, exciting color, but more muted and more subtle and usually associated with like love and romance, but also softness. Purple, because of its association with the Roman Empire and the difficulty of creating purple dye, usually means luxury or elegance in some way. Uh, black is so demure and subtle, and it usually is denoting something that's very classy or elegant. And white, because it doesn't show a dirt on it, if it's pure white, usually means something that's very clean, often very clinical. But it can also be calm, and it's a very modern kind of color. So thinking about that when you're creating your colors are important to creating the mood. In fact, it's so important that uh, over at Pixar, when they're writing a movie, they do what's called color scripting, where it's not quite a storyboard, but they'll do these illustrations of the whole movie to give you the idea of starting our character of Mr. Incredible. We start with this big, colorful adventure, contrasting between blue and yellow scenes to show excitement and dynamism. Then we get to his modern life, which is very, very gray. And gradually, as he gets into adventure, color starts to come back into his life. And in fact, we really see color explode back into his life a little bit when he does something heroic, something he shouldn't be doing. We see this yellow, this orangish color come back in to indicate to the audience he's getting back into the life of it before coming back to his dull, boring life because that's how we understand the contrast. As we go through, we start to see the highlights of blues versus oranges. And a lot of orange and red when things are particularly dangerous. You might notice that in the scene where their, their plane explodes and they're in the water, it's very, very red because it's denoting warning or danger. And then they're secretively sneaking in. It's all, it's all very surreptitious under the cover of night, so it's very muted and very blue. And then we get them all functioning together sort of as a family as it gets very pleasant and we turn into a bright, colorful, happy ending where you've integrated the color into the real world that represents their family life. So the color scripting is actually really important to understanding how we're supposed to feel about these things. You can find these. There's a lot of great sites. Uh, there's a whole movie color script site that I pulled some of these through, and you can see just the difference of the, the grand range of greens in When Marnie Was There by Hayao Miyazaki or the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother, We're At That, which uses an extremely muted and color-corrected tone. Even though it's sort of to get the sepia look, it was one of the first major Hollywood movies to use a color correction throughout the whole thing to create this blue-orange contrast throughout it to give it an, an old sepia tone look that looked like the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Or something like uh, Raves of the Lost Ark, where we can see that everything is in terms of browns and hues, but they're trying to focus on the golden. And so everything in the background doesn't have quite as much yellow on it, 
but we see a lot of gold in the idol and that gold is reflected into Indy's face, drawing our attention to his face and the idol that he's looking at. Color scripting, the idea of using light and texture together to draw our attention is really, really important. Lighting matters a lot. Uh, this is uh, an environment piece by one of MSU's grads, Pete Braun, who is now a lighting artist at Gearbox. And this was the piece that got him hired at Gearbox. I wanna bring this up because he did an amazing work job on this, but specifically on the lighting. The modeling, the texturing of this piece is fine. It's it's nice, pleasant looking, but it's not what you would expect in a super AAA um, kind of portfolio piece. And I think Pete would be the first person to say that, but what it showed was lighting talent and lighting skill, and it got him hired as a professional lighting artist. And check out his uh, by his, por his portfolio art station. His lighting work is incredible. But lighting, as I've said, is a huge part of your experience. And in fact, when we're doing environments, lighting is a big part of what you do in modeling. So when you're working inside of, uh, say, an environment art piece, you generally only spend about 20% of the time modeling and about 20% of the time laying things out. 40% of our time is spent in purely texturing. What are the colors of the surface? And another 20% of that time is worked on lighting. So everything that could be considered modeling is only about 40% of your effort. Everything that's in lighting and color is about 60% when we're working in environments. They're that important. It's different for characters, but for environments, it's really crucial to start lighting right away. Uh, another piece by an um, MLR MCU grad, Thomas Lyon, who started his block out and then lit it right away, which helped him figure out what things need to happen and where he needed to put focus, effort, and attention. So with that, we're gonna dive into a little bit of how we can actually control the lights in our scenes, create skyboxes, and environment art lighting.